Hey everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm Ivan Vergeliev, as you heard, and I'm going to be speaking some more about persistent data structures. Um, you already have the foundation, so I'm going to dive a little deeper into some topics. Um, so I'll start with something about me uh, beyond what Valor said. I'm currently working at a company called Heap. We do web and mobile analytics, but without any tracking code. If anyone is using analytics, maybe you know how that hurts. Uh, before that, I've done real-time music recommendations at Sound SoundCloud. Um, I've been at I've done internships at Google and Facebook, been at a bunch of other companies. Um, and I also won a bronze medal with the International Olympiads in Informatics um, in 2009. How many of you know what the IOI is? Okay, so like a small part of the room. Um, okay, so uh, description for everyone else. The International, basically, the International Olympiads in Informatics is a programming competition. We have like five hours to solve three super hard algorithmic problems. Uh, so we need like a lot of knowledge in algorithms and data structures and uh, um, and performance and like problem solving in those areas. Um, so what what do IOI people have in common? Well. They, they care about a, a lot about performance, um, except for like a lot of other things. You need to be able to solve the problem first, but then you need to make it fast. Um, so if you if you're in a, in a programming competition um, and you figure out the right solution, but you write it five times slower than uh, someone else, you might have 20 points instead of 100, for example, um, and lose the first place because you're too slow. Um, so you, you can say that like writing efficient brute force solutions is one of the most important skills in the programming competition. Uh, I actually remember one time when um, there was like the hardest problem in the competition. Uh, there was only one person who managed to solve it. I was not that person, but I managed to write the fastest brute force approach, which got me the, which got me the second place. Uh, so like, it's, it's really important. And if you didn't get this so far, I care about performance too. Um, and so me caring about performance led to me having a kind of a rough start with functional programming. Not because of inherent qualities, but more like because of mindset of people. Um, because my, my first touch of functional programming was at university. Um, and I would see things that are like nice mental exercises, but I would look at them and they would seem like toys. They wouldn't seem like hard, hardcore, high performance, production ready things. And I would wonder, well, this seems horribly slow. How does it, how does it actually work? Like, how does it work in production? How do you make it fast? Um, and what I would usually hear is, oh, you, you know, just try to understand the concept. It's going to expand your mind, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Which is, like, kind of fine for teaching, uh, but it's not great for production, because, like, um, that's not exactly how computers work. You don't feed the CPU abstract ideas, um, and it returns something, or at least not the, the level that I'd like to understand programming. Um, and so at some point I found out about persistent data structures, which kind of solve some of those problems. So I'm going to tell you a bit more about those. So this is how we're going to structure the, the rest of the talk. First, I'm going to talk a bit more about types of persistent data structures. And I don't mean types as in persistent map, persistent vector, persistent list, whatever, but like levels of persistence, because there are multiple level, uh, levels that a data structure can be persistent in. Uh, then I'll say a bit more about applications beyond the um, side effect avoidance and immutability. Um, and then I'll speak a bit more about implementation and performance considerations and why some of the things uh, that you heard in the previous talks are happening the way they are. Okay. So we start with, with types of persistent data structures and now I'll be comparing them to, to version control systems because in version control systems you also have uh, like history of data modifications and stuff like that. So the, the first level of persistence is um, ephemerally persistent data structures. It's what most programmers actually call data structures. Um, so an um, ephemerally, ephemerally persistent data structure is one where you, once you modify it, the previous, previous version is gone. Um, and it's a default in imperative and uh, object-oriented programming languages. And it's like programming without version control. Um, so you have no history and it's very hard to synchronize between people who modify the, the data structure or like the code. Um, after that, you get partially persistent data structures. In partially persistent data structures, you can modify, it, modify the newest version. So if you're at uh, head, you can modify it and you can look at the previous versions. So like the previous versions. Uh, what you cannot do is branch. So basically what you can do is if you're at head, like this is an actual Git history, um, you can do a git checkout to look at the previous version, uh, but what you cannot do is do a commit and branch out of this previous version. 
So it's the, linear, the, the version history is only linear. Uh, it's like Git without branching, which I guess is kind of like SVN or something. <laughs> um, then the next, the next level is fully persistent data structures. Um, these are the ones that Anjana talked about. Um, and it's like you can now do branching. And this means that the data structure, like the version history is now a tree. Uh, because you can go to any previous version and modify it and get a new branch and, and like get a lot of branches in some form of tree. Um, okay, so what is missing in order to form a, like a proper, so now in, in git terms you can do git commit and git checkout dash b and then git checkout to a previous branch. What is missing in order to make it a val like a actual type uh, version control system that you can use? You can use this in, a, in production? Like you, you use a, like you start writing a feature and then it exists in a separate branch. So what do you need to do after that? Merge. Yeah, exactly. You need, to, you need to merge it. And that's what the next level of persistent data structures can do. Um, you can branch out, but you can also branch in. So like you, you can merge. Uh, basically you can take a, a few of the older versions of a data structure and merge them into a new one. Uh, these are called confluently persistent data structures. Um, and this is like the, the version history is now a direct basically acyclic graph. Um, so you don't have loops, but it's not a tree anymore. Yeah, you can basically have two branches and you can merge one of them into the other. Is that readable? Probably not. Anyway. Um, okay, so now, now that we've discussed the different types, um, let's discuss what you can do with them. Um, so, so the first thing that you can do is avoiding side effects. You already heard about this uh, during your previous talk. It's pretty useful. Uh, but there are some things that, like beyond the avoiding side effects that you can do. Uh, and like some of the things that I'm gonna, gonna mention can be pretty obvious if you're used to a functional programming paradigm, but they're uh, like actually enabled by having persistent data structures. So the second thing that you can do is um, you can do easier, much easier multi-threading. Um, you can not have race conditions if you don't modify your data. Um, so you can do, for example, if you wanna iterate over a vector or whatever uh, in a, in an imperative programming language, it, it can be much harder because you have to deal with the CPU, changing counters, changing positions, changing whatever internal state you have in, the, in, your, da in your data structure, uh, and the different th threads can see different versions, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this is much easier with immutable data because you, you don't modify the data. Um, uh, I mean, it's made more difficult in some situations. For example, if you, if you don't have garbage collection, uh, I'll mention this briefly in the implementation situations afterwards. So another application you can have is um, transaction rollback. So the examples are in some kind of pseudocode. Uh, but anyway, say you have a transaction, like you wanna have a transaction where you add a customer and you do a bunch of things uh, with a new customer ID. Uh, you start a transaction, you have a lot of customer IDs, you, you add the new one and then you commit the transaction. But what, what do you do if the transaction fails to, fails to commit? Um, well, in the standard imperative way, you can do something like this. Uh, like you can do the reverse option. Like you add the ID here and if it fails, you just remove the latest element. But what if we had, instead of one list, we had 10 and we, need, we needed to do like 50 modifications to them. It, it gets really hard to track everything. Uh, it gets hard to like handle uh, exceptions in the catch uh, or whatever. Uh, it's really much, much more complicated logic. So what, what you can do is you can create, use, use a persistent data structure for the custom IDs, create a new version for when you want to com commit the transaction, commit it, and if it succeeds, you return the new custom IDs, and if it fails, you just return the old ones. Well, and like, um, this is trivial if you're used to a functional programming uh, inter uh, interface and programming, but like, the, the idea is that you can put all your states, like if you want to modify 15 data structures, you can put them all in a common persistent data structure and just return the previous version if something fails. Um, another thing that you can do on a more, like a higher level is optimistic UI. Uh, so optimistic UI is this concept where, so I, I don't know if you've used Trello, um, you've probably seen that moving a card from one board to the other, or from one list to the other, is like pretty quick. Um, so in my mind, I'm almost, almost certain that the API request to move this here has not completed when we successfully finish the transaction, like when we show it to the user. Um, 
So the idea of optimistic UI is that people hate waiting and that API calls almost succeed, like it uh, almost always succeed. Like if your backend is any good, you're gonna, you're gonna have a success in this moving operation like 95% of the time on, or something like that. So the, the front end already knows what's gonna happen. Uh, so it can just uh, speculatively uh, play it. So like the front end knows that when I move this from this list to the other, it's gonna happen. Like the thing that's gonna happen is moving from the, from the other one list to the other. It doesn't need to wait for the API request to succeed. Um, so what you can do is pretend that the API request succeeded and update the UI. And then sometimes failures do occur. And what do you do, you do then when you use persistent data structures? Um, so you represent your whole state as a persistent data structure, update one of the lists with the item from the other one, remove the list here, and display the speculative state. And then you do the API call, you save the new state, and if it tears out, you, you just call a function with the old state and restore it. So we, you can be quick like 95% of the time, and when something happens, you can just restore with like one line, because you, you're using your persistent data structure and um, you, can, you can use the, the old version. Um, and if you think about it, this is effectively a transaction rollback, like the backend failed to commit a transaction, um, but it's not slightly higher level, slightly closer to the user. And one is interesting extension to this is, what if the server knows something that we don't? So like, for example, we are uh, playing a first, first person shooter game and someone shoots at us and, uh, and hits us. Um, so then maybe our blood level is gonna decrease, decrease or something like that. Well, we, can we can use uh, the completely persistent data structures and when the API call succeeds, we can get the server state and we can have a new state that merges the server state and the speculative state that we had. So the spe our speculative state can be, oh, I jumped from here to there, and uh, new the server state can be, oh, but then you actually died in the meantime. Uh, so it, I can, like for course here, I'll display the new state. Um, oh no, here's the state. But like, if I succeed, I would both know that um, I have died while jumping and I can display that in an efficient way. Um, then speaking about uh, transactions, um, you can, we can speak some more about Postgres MVCC. How many people know what MVCC is? Okay. Um, so for the rest of you, MVCC is basically a way to, to deal with transactions in a way that doesn't involve locks and stuff like that. Um, so instead of, instead of modi modifying a role in place, when you update it, you create a new version and then each transaction is dealing with one specific version of the, of the role. Um, and so every time you modify it, you basically create a new role um, and copy all the, all the things. So if, if you have, for example, Postgres has support for arrays in roles, you have to copy all the, all the arrays into the, into the new role, which, I don't know, to me it sounds pretty much like a persistent data structure can be applied in order to store the arrays in Postgres. Now, of course, the Postgres team obviously knows about persistent data structures, so there are probably reasons not to implement this, the, a database like this, uh, but as far as I know, there are some databases that actually take this approach and store everything in a persistent data structure. So an, another approach that you can do, another thing that you can do using the history is you can implement undo and browsing history. So like if you, if you do uh, history.push state, for example, if you keep all your state in the persistent data structure, you can preserve the previous versions and if someone wants to go back 100 pages, you can just restore to the state from 100 versions ago. Um, you can do this with like storing modifications, but it doesn't scale nicely because you have to keep like for each API action, for example, adding a custom ID, you need to keep the reverse action uh, and be very careful to always insert into the, like to always execute the reverse action when you have the forward action in the uh, action history. And it also doesn't scale well because if you want to go back, like if you're using Vim, for example, you want to go back a thousand actions, it's, you have to replay a thousand, uh, a thousand actions. And if you use a persistent data structure, you can just jump back to the version from a thousand actions ago. Um, and one last application, which is a bit more um, unorthodox, maybe, uh, which is you can use it for solving geometry problems. Um, so this one is a bit more involved of an example. So if, if you don't follow, like, let me know and I'll try to explain a bit more. Um, at the specific problem, we will look at this point location. So the point location problem is you have a lot of line segments. Uh, they intersect, intersect only at their endpoints. And given the point, like for example, this point right here, you want to determine what region it is in. So like this one region, this is another, and so on. 
So if you think that this is too esoteric, consider what your browser is doing every time you click something. Um, it, it's a bit simpler because there's like polygons, like rectangles, for example, and not these weird things. But you can have them in a game or something like that. Uh, so it's not a like it's not a real problem. So we'll discuss a solution, and we, then we'll look how we can apply a persistent data structure to it. So the first thing we'll do is we'll split the the plane into separate vertical slabs, uh, like into vertical sections. And then we look at each vertical se section separately. So if you look at it, the regions in it are ordered in the same way throughout the whole section. So like this one is on the top, or like this one is at the top and this one is second, throughout all the white section over here. They don't change order um, because there's no, there's no intersections in the vertical slab that we're looking at, uh, the vertical split. Um, they're not, they're, they're ordered and you can do things with them. With, what, what can we do with order things? Well, we can do, we can do a binary search. Um, so the thing is that when we are here, we can determine what region we are in using a binary search or like a binary search tree using just this vertical line, just this vertical sc split. And like the weird thing about this is that the, the bounds, like the boundaries of the intervals change a bit. Like for example, here we're gonna have a different bound. Like if we look at x equals, I don't know, whatever, 10, and if we look at x equals zero in the same vertical split, we're gonna have a different boundary, but the order is gonna be the same. So we can keep the binary search tree based on the starting points, and then we can search based on the order, based on the boundaries. Does that make any sense to anyone? Okay. Um, <laughs> cool. And then since we have like we we have a way to search to each vertical split. What we can do then is do a horizontal binary search in order to determine where our point is located. So like if we determine that it's here, we can do this in logarithmic time. Then we can continue searching only in this subtree and do another binary search or like a search in a binary search tree. So like the, the plan is split them up into vertical stripes at the intersections of the points. So you can get like this white stripe here, but all of them in order then create a binary search tree for each stripe, and then do a binary search to find the, the proper stripe, and then inside the vertical stripe, inside the, the, this vertical stripe, which we know is ordered, you can locate the proper region using the binary search tree. Um, but then, the, like, this is pretty cool. We can do a lookup in log n time plus log n time for two binary searches. Which is, which is great, which is again log n. Uh, but the problem is that uh, n binary trees means all of n squared memory. Like each binary tree has all of n memory requirements. And then we need n of them, so we, we have all of n squared memory requirements. So what we can do is we can use the fact that the delta between the trees is very limited. So if you look at one vertical stripe, like this one here, and then the next one, like this one here, you'll see that the top segment and these two bottom segments are going to stay the same in the next one. Like here's the top one, here's the two bottom, here are the two bottom ones, and they stay in the same order. Like the top one is still the top one, like it's still above the, the ones below. Those ones st are still in the same order. Um, what changes is that we those two line segments end, and those two new line segments begin. So so the delta between those two trees is only like four line segments, like two deletions and two additions. We, we delete the ones that end there, and we add the new ones. Um, so what this means is that we only need to insert each line segment once at the point where it starts, and we need to remove it once at the point, w the point where it ends. So we can use a bi persistent binary search tree, which is like very similar to the binary, binary trees that you saw in the previous lecture. Um, you can, we can use a persistent one in order to represent the deltas in an efficient way. So basically what we do is take this dimension to be the time. So like this would be the first version of the binary uh, search tree, this would be the second, this would be the third, and they would be represented in a persistent search tree. Um, and then this would be the other dimension, which I call, I call Y here. Uh, and you can do a search in the binary search tree inside this dimension. Um, so we get a log uh, logarithmic lookup again, and we get n log n memory because we have, like, log, yeah, something like that. It's it's not all of n squared uh, in the memory requirements. Right. 
Uh, so that's it for the uh, applications. Does anyone have questions about the geometric one? I guess you got the previous ones. But okay, cool. Um, and then we'll I'll talk about a little bit about performance considerations. So let's start with what do you do with old nodes? So when you when you create a new node, you basically copy the path. Like when you add a new value, you copy the path to it to the top. So if you had a, the binary search tree or like the binary tree access, and then you created a new version by inserting E inside the binary search tree, you'd have a new one called Wise. Um, and it, that, that's pretty cool and awesome. Uh, but then what happens when access goes out of, out of scope? Well, we, we need to get rid of it, right? Um, and this getting rid of it means that we somehow have to free the memory and like delete whatever resources it was pointing to or whatever. Um, so that's really easy when you have garbage collection, but otherwise it gets more complicated. So if you don't have garbage collection, this means that you have to take care of freeing the memory yourself. So like in a language like C++, this would mean that you need to do reference counting. So you'd put a pointer, um, so each pointer to a child node would be a reference counted pointer. So you'd count how many things are pointing to a given node. And when they get to, sh to zero, you dis destroy the node. Um, so like you can use a C++ shared pointer. Uh, but now we get a, a whole lot of problems. So like we went from a completely immutable thing, now we, each node that we have is, is mutable. Uh, we need to synchronize it. Um, so like if we, have, if we have a lot of things that are touching the same version of the data searcher, there can be a lot of, uh, a lot of synchronization slowness because we need to synchronize around the counter, around the increase, uh, increments and decrements of the counter. Um, it's also, it, it can also be really slow to destruct. So like if at some point you need to destroy a whole, like a binary tree that has a million elements in it, you'd get to the decreasing the shared pointer of the root node to point to zero, and then you'd cascade to all the all the other nodes, and you'd need to delete all, delete all of them at the same time, which can lead to like basically something like stop the world garbage collection, but it's supposed to us. Um, and it also needs, like in the trivial implementation, it would, um, destroy all the elements in like recursively, it, like if you use a standard C++ shared pointer, which can you cost to cost stack overflows because of the recursion if you have a really large tree or like a, a persistent list or something. Okay, so you really want garbage collection otherwise your life, be, your life is harder. Um, then next, uh, I wanna bring up again the, the question of why you use 32 slots per node. Um, so I'll start a bit far away and then build up to it again. So for starters, why, why are binary search trees binary? Well, they're binary because we, like, why not use 1,000 ways search trees? Uh, like log, log n of n equals one, so it would be pretty efficient to use a n way search tree. So why, why not do it? Well, why not? Well, go ahead. Um, so memory can actually be pretty efficient if you do it the right way, uh, but the thing is that you have to do things inside the nodes. Um, so you, you need to be able to search and insert inside the nodes. Um, so the complexities are not, not exactly, like if k is the number of uh, slots you have in the node, the complexities are not exactly of log k of n, uh, log base k of n. The complexities are more like for the search if you keep some kind of sorted structure inside the node, so like you keep 1,000 elements uh, in a sorted way inside the node, you need to search, like you need log k inside each node, so like a logarithm of uh, 1,000 operations, and then you need log k of n in order to search through the whole tree. And then the insert is even more complicated, so it's like you need to, for example, if you have a list of 1,000 elements and you want to insert it something in the middle, you have to move 500 elements to the to the back, so it's more like k of log k of n. So this is this is the reason why binary search trees are binary. It's much more easier, like it's much easier to keep them sorted this way. Um, if we have like a thousand way search tree, then each node would need to support efficient insertion of elements in search, which sounds exactly like what we use the binary search tree for. So we would end up having to implement the exact same thing, thing inside the node that we're implementing the data structure for, so it doesn't exactly make sense. 
Um, okay, but so like, what's wrong with binary? Right? Like, why would you want to increase it? Um, like, if we we would do the, roughly the same number of operations with binary and non-binary, but there's something different about being binary and non-binary, like storing more things inside a single node. Um, and the, the thing is basically memory. So if you have a, like I switched to kind of C++ here, but if you have a node structure uh, with a left pointer, a right pointer, and then an int value, how much memory is, are you gonna wait for memory, memory if you tell the CPU to, to load this node? Taking bets here. Roughly, one byte, one megabyte, one gigabyte. Okay, so value is saying 12 bytes. But the thing is that, so yeah, this structure is, is indeed like 12 bytes on a 32-bit machine. So like each porter is four bytes and then they int is four bytes again. Uh, but then this is not exactly, not exactly how memory works. Uh, so memory works with uh, with cache lines. So in order to load anything from memory, you need to you need to use a you need to read the, the whole cache line. So a cache line in most most CPUs and most memory architectures is uh, 64 bytes. So you read those 12 bytes, but the CPU actually read 64 bytes for you. So if you read just the, the 12 bytes, you, ju you just use those, then you're basically wasting the other 52 bytes. Because this is just how memory architectures and memory hierarchies and caches work. Um, and it's even more inefficient if you, if you read the data from disk. So if, if, for example, if it's, if it's swapping, then you need to read the data from disk and like the smallest unit that you can read from disk is like four kilobytes or something. Uh, so you're gonna be wasting basically all the four kilobytes except for 12 bits. Um, okay, so what is, what is different about yeah, so just to wrap the, the binary search trees uh, up. The thing is that basically when you have a lot of interactions, like you have a lot of log levels, you're wasting a lot of memory on each level. Like you're wasting a lot of CPU time to read the, the, the cache line uh, because it expects that you're gonna be using the rest of the cache line as well. Um, and you, you have to do it a lot of times as well. So you're reading a lot of memory that you don't need to read. Uh, so how about bitmap vector twice? How does the performance, like how do, how do the, uh, complexities work there exactly because we saw that the binary search trees complexities are not exactly what they're usually advertised. So the in a bitmap vector try, uh, that's the structure that you saw in the previous talk. Um, the the nice thing is that you, we don't really need to search. Like we know the exact index that we care about, so we can just go directly to index five, which would be like 101 in the in the bit partition thing. So the lookup is indeed really just log k of n. Uh, we have log k of n levels of nodes, and on each node, we perform a constant number of operations. Um, and so, let's just set k equals n. If the, uh, the performance characteristics are actually like this, we just set k equals n, and we would have like constant performance. And well, this is actually what, what you would do with one small detail. This vector try is not persistent. So if you set k equals n, then it's gonna turn into what? This it's gonna be an array, like, yeah. You're gonna be storing all the elements next to, to each other. Uh, but the trick here is that we haven't discussed persistence uh, and update complexity. So like, lookup complexity is log k of n. Uh, you do constant work per node. But in the update, when you wanna do it, do it in a persistent way, you have to copy each node in the path from the, okay. You need to copy each node from the path, on the path from the root to the value. So you would do, two operations here, four operations here, and four operations here, which in like a 32-way branching node would be 32 operations here, 32 operations here, 32 here. Uh, so it's really more like k of log, k times log k of n again, uh, because we need to copy k elements for each node. So we basically need to balance the two operations. If we're only using, if we're only ever doing lookups, we can just use a single, simple array. Uh, because we don't need per persistence and updates. Uh, but if we do a lot of updates, um, it's gonna be like better to tweak for this performance as well. So what usually happens in like uh, li libraries like the Scala standard library or the closure, closure one, is that someone decides what's the usual rate, like for example, uh, nine to one of lookup to updates. So like we're doing 90% lookups and 10% updates. 
Uh, and so they tune a workload that is kind of similar to what you do, like they, what they expect you to do, uh, and tune those complexities in the proper way, like strike the proper balance between the complexities. Um, so basically, when we have the constant lookup for per node, that means that the more we increase k, the faster we're going to get for lookups. But for updates, it's a bit more complicated because we have like uh, as we increase k, this this multiplier is going to get smaller, but this one is going to get larger. So it's it's not going to be exactly linear. So what happens we, if you do performance testing is that lookups actually do become faster as you get a large, does, is that legible? Okay, so basically the, the blue line here is index, like right, lookup performance, and the red one, or the orange one or whatever, is update performance. So as we discussed, index or lookup is getting faster and faster as you get to more slots per node, like a larger K. And then updates are, are getting faster up to some point, and then they're getting more complicated because the, the log K of N uh, cannot decrease too much, like it's already pretty small, but the K itself is getting is getting larger. If you put 64 nodes, uh, 64 slots per node, it's gonna have to copy 64 times on, on 64 items on every level. Uh, so what the, perf the implementations usually do is say, well, yeah, 32 is like a pretty good balance. Lookups are fairly fast. 64 doesn't get, a, get us much faster. And then updates are still reasonably fast. They're not the fastest they can be. Uh, but they're also not getting slower yet. Um, so this is like this is the one of the main arguments about how how you decide how large your trees can be. And I think I think in closure, maybe in Scala, you can set the width of the tree. So if you if you do your own performance testing, can you decide that like 64 slots per node is better for your your, your, applica uh, your application? I think you can change that. I'm not sure. Um, anyway, so if after that you need even more performance, there are still things that you can do. Uh, one of them is called the tail optimization. Uh, sorry, technical problems. Okay, so tail optimization. So the, the argument here is what do people usually do with vectors, so like lists? Well, the, the most frequent operation is usually to append to them. So like you create one and then you append multiple times. Um, so the idea of the tail optimization is to, to tune for this use case uh, and like optimize your data structure heavily in a way that appends are fast. Um, so the way to do this, or like one way to do this, is to separate the tail from the tree. So you'd have like, this is one tree and this would be the next version of the tree. Um, so you'd have the standard branching here and the standard index and update logic. But separately from that, you keep the last 32 elements or like the last uh, K elements inside a separate tail. Um, and when you, when you append something, if there is enough spots in the tail, you just copy the tail and insert into it. You only need to copy the tail. You don't need to, to do anything with, with the tree. Well, you, you need to copy the root as well because it points to the tail. But you don't need to modify the tree structure. Um, so that means that basically on, for example, if you're using 32-way branching trees, on 31 out, out of 32 appends, you'd have a constant performance, like constant complexity of appends. And on the 32nd 30, 30 one, uh, you'd have the logarithmic complexity. Uh, so uh, that's pretty that's pretty cool and uh, nice for performance. Uh, and basically, one, when the when the tail gets full, like when it gets to like two elements here or 32 elements, you just put it down the tree and create a new tail that's empty. Um, an even more like an extension of this approach is Scala's like Scala has a concept called the focus, uh, which is like the tail but for any index. So like basically. If we figure out that the user is currently looking at this node, like at index zero, there's a pretty high probability that they're going to be looking at index one next. That's basically how caching and memory hierarchies work. Uh, so what we, what we can do is instead of keeping the tail separate, we can keep the current node separate. So, so like we can extract it from the tree, know out this pointer, and only modify this one as long as we're in the same in the same node. So like in, in, with 32-way branching, if we start at index zero, and for example, we're doing iteration, uh, we can extract the first sub-node as the focus of the tree and move it out, 
and have constant access to it. And for the next 32 operations, we're going to have constant access to the tree, uh, like to the elements that we need. Uh, and then when we are done with it, we can just move it back into the tree and change the focus to the next to the next node. So it optimizes for local operations. Um, it, it assumes that people frequently, like if you touch one index, you're really likely to to touch the indexes before or after it around that basically. And if it's if it's all still too slow, you can do transients. I'm not sure if they exist in Scala, they exist in Clojure for sure. Uh, basically a transient is uh, you take a data a persistent data structure and say, okay, for this for the next one million operations, I don't want it to be persistent. Like I just want to do a million operations really quickly. Um, and it doesn't preserve versions in those 1,000 operations or like one million, million operations. And then when you're done with them, we, you can go back to the persistent version. Uh, so like just missing the one, the last one million operations. Um, so that's pretty fast, uh, like pretty fast if you want to do it in like a uh, inside loop in some high performance application or something. So one thing here is you may wonder how, how extensible is this? So we mostly talked about arrays and vectors and a bit about hash tables. So what if you have this complicated graph uh, or like whatever complicated data structure you have and you want to make it persistent? Well, there are a lot of research results, but I want to focus on one interesting observation, at least to me, which is that um, basically if you're used to programming in C++ or C or any low level language, you like using pointers, you, you can be used to the fact that memory is kind of like a huge array of numbers. So like each, it's a huge array of fins basically. So if you have a really complicated data structure, it still maps to the to the same random access memory, to, to the same array of integers. So what, what you can do is you can take the, like whatever complicated data structure you have, like a graph for, for example, and replace it, replace the memory operations with a persistent vector. And then whenever you change something, the persistent vector changes from beneath you. So like basically creating persistent memory. So like looking at memory not as a random access memory that is gone when you modify it, but like using a persistent vector to just modify it, just preserve the things that, that the changes that you're doing. Okay, um, I wanna wrap this up with, with an actual example from uh, a work that I did in my, my company where one of my coworkers had implemented something where he obviously valued having no side effects and immutable data structures. So he implemented, uh, like he basically kept the state of our whole cluster in a data structure that is immutable, but like immutable in a way that he copied the whole data structure when he wanted to change it. And like he wrote this like two years ago and since then our cluster had grown like 10x or 100x in size. So this calculation was basically making a lot of things in pop basically impossible in our in our use case. So I, we bought this using Immutable JS, which you already heard about, and the performance gains were like 13 to 15x improvement in runtime. So we went from like 30, 20 minutes to less than two minutes. So this thing things actually actually work in production. Um, okay, that's all we got. Thank you.